morning. Welcome to a new month. It's my favorite month. It's December. Yo, Christmas is around the corner. I know you're getting ready for all those chapatis and buzichoma. I don't know what you have in your country. Please put it on the chat. We want to know how you're celebrating your Christmas. And before that, we want to praise God with some few songs and dance. So please, wherever you are, join us and let's praise God together. Come on, let's go. We are so grateful to God. What a year this has been. So we came together to sing this song. Says Nashukuru. Thank you, Jesus. Hey. Umeni pa uhai baba na fasi nyingi ne asikumpia baba na shukuru. Come on, Gabu. Tonya roho na mwili tabibu wa ajabu ewe Yesu baba. Nashukuru Umeondoa la ana baba Kabadilisha kuwa furaha Baba Nashukuru Kilio changu ewe Yesu Kabadilisha kuwa furaha Baba Nashukuru Kwa moyo wangu wote Asante kwa ko Masia Nashukuru Kwa moyo Kwa moyo Wangu wate Nasema Asante kwa ko Masia Nashukuru Come on, she has a turn to hear Come on Kuwa mnyonge baba Umekuwa mgubu yangu baba Na shukuru Na yomi shale ya yule mwovu Haijani pata umenilinda baba Na shukuru Hey, nilipo kuwa mnyonge baba Umekuwa mguvu yangu baba Hey, nashukuru Siku moyo, kwa moyo, wangu wote Nasema, asante kwa ko, masia Nashukuru Kwa moyo, kwa moyo, wangu wote Nasema, asante kwa ko, masia Nashukuru Kwa moyo, kwa moyo Wangu wate Nasema asante kwa ko Masia Nashukuru Kwa moyo, kwa moyo Wangu wate Nasema asante kwa ko Masia Nashukuru Shinaza tunde Nasema asante kwa ko Masia Nashukuru Kwa moyo Wangu wate Nasema asante kwa ko Masia Nashukuru If you know you are grateful to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Come on Comment session right now and put your claps together. Come on, put some claps out there. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a year this has been, man. And you know what? For sure, with all of our hearts, we are saying thank you to the King of Kings. Maybe you're there and you don't have a reason to say thank you. But my prayer is that even before the year ends, we still have a few more, have a few more weeks. That God will visit you right where you are. That you shall encounter. The God of the impossible. His name is Yahweh. His name is Jesus. His name is Lord. Now this next song says that we give him all the glory. Because we're in a season of gratitude. We have every reason to give God all the praise. For there's no other God like him. 
Lord, we are ready for you. Be glorified in the highest. You are faithful. There's no other God like you. We give you praise, Jesus. Yes, Lord.
time we sing, oh, Yahweh, yeah, Yahweh. Indeed, Lord, we just declare your goodness, your greatness. You are Yahweh. There is none that can compare to you, oh God. Even as we have sung, we give you the worship, we give you the glory, we give you the praise, oh God. Heavenly Father, there is none that can be compared to you. You alone deserve it, O oh God. You deserve the honor, the power. Lord, we thank you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we wish you an amazing service ahead. We still have so much lined up for you. So please don't go anywhere. In fact, this is a good time to send someone that message and tell them, touch is on. Join in. God bless you so much. Greetings, Mavuno. My name is Moridi Wanjao. I am the senior pastor of Mavuno Church, also known as Pastor M. And I'm so excited that you're worshipping with us today. Last week, I uh, shared a heads up about one of some of the things we're excited about in this coming year. Uh, some of the things that we are really, really passionate about 2022. We believe that 2022 will be a year of unprecedented spiritual growth, culture change, church growth, and also financial freedom for us as a church community. And uh, if you missed that video for any reason, I want to just encourage you, go on our website, www.mavunochurch.org and check out for the Free the Future uh, button and click on that because I think it's just going to encourage you. Some of the things we're excited about and we're trusting God for as a church, for every one of us in this coming year. Now, I also want to uh, share that we're, we're, we're going to be challenging every single one of us uh, to consider uh, giving a fast food offering uh, early next year to help us pay off uh, the mortgage for our Hill City uh, headquarters. Now, I want to just talk a bit today about fast food offerings because many people are asked, what are fast food offerings? How do they work? Are they biblical? And, and I want to talk about uh, the fact that Moses uh, was the first in the scripture there. He was a great law giver who talked about fast food offerings. And he wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 4, the first fruits of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the first fleece of your sheep you shall give to him. So, so this concept of uh, first fruits, it was rooted in Israel's history, though a, 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 a farming people. And uh, basically what happened at harvest time, they had been uh, sowing and putting all their crops in the ground or looking after their sh uh, sheep. Uh, or their animals and harvest time would be the time when they are getting a benefit back for all their hard work and what God challenged them is every time that when the time came to give their harvest when the harvest came they would take the best part of it the first part of it and they would bring it bring it to his house uh, as a way of just saying thank you uh, to the one who had given them everything uh, it showed that they trusted God enough to provide for the rest uh, of the year uh, for them now the first the word fast fruit is actually a Hebrew uh, the, the word that the scripture uses a Hebrew word it's called it's bikurim and what it means is the promise to come bikurim the promise to come for the Israelites giving the fast fruits was a way of freeing their future it honored God and it provoked him to bless all the harvest that would come afterwards. And you, you see it all throughout the Old Testament. King Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your produce. Later on, the great nation builder, Nehemiah, he wrote to, uh, of himself and of his leaders, Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 35, he says, We obligate ourselves, uh, we obligate ourselves, speaking about him and his leaders, to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all, uh, of every fruit of every tree, year by year to the house of the Lord. So this is a, a great leader in Israel and he's saying, this is what's going to happen going forward. We as God's people, every year, we're going to bring a fast fruit uh, to God's house. And in the New Testament, this concept is still found, but it takes on a more symbolic meaning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, Paul talks about the, uh, Jesus Christ being the fast fruit of all who have gone, uh, who have fallen asleep. And basically what he was saying is Jesus was God's first fruit. He was his, his best, his one and only son, uh, the, the best gift he had to give to humanity. And in the same way that God asks us to give our best, our first to him, that God gives Jesus as the first fruit uh, back to us. Now, because we're not a farming community, fast fruit today looks very different for different people. 
Uh, maybe it's your first paycheck of every year. I know there are several people in our congregation. This is their practice. And every year they give their first paycheck uh, as a way of saying, God, we honor you. Uh, and we know that everything that is to come, you will provide and make enough. Uh, it could be a bonus at work. For some people, it's their bonus at the end of the year and they give their, their bonus and they say, this is what our first fruit is. Uh, for some of you, it's in, you're in business and it's your first business income in the year. Or it could be a dividend check or a rent check if you're a landlord. Uh, these are all harvest time moments when your hard work is paying off and they're great opportunities to turn back to God and say, Lord, in gratitude for all our blessings, here is my first fruit. Now, I wanted to teach a bit about that just to give you a bit of a biblical background to say that yes, fast fruits are biblical and yes, uh, we do practice them in these times. But I want to just prepare you as you're preparing to give your first fruits uh, in the new year uh, over and above your ties to help us uh, free our future as a church family. The thing I want to say is I'm excited about the journey of faith and what it's going to open up for every one of our families as we take this step in faith and in trust uh, of the Lord who provides for the rest of the year that is to come. Now, I want you to just feel free to write any questions. Uh, if you have any questions, write me, uh, write us. Uh, you can use info at, uh, at, at mavunochurch.org. Uh, if you have any thoughts you'd like to contribute or questions you'd like us to converse, I'm planning to just talk about uh, this adventure, Free the Future, that we're entering into uh, over this next uh, month. Uh, just to prepare us so that we get ready for January and the, and the year that is to come. And so if you have any questions you'd like us to address in that time, let me know. You can uh, also uh, just let us know whether you what you're excited about. Those of you who've given uh, Fast Fruits before, what has been your experience? We'd love to hear your stories and maybe share some of your testimonies. Uh, I'll be talking next week about the difference between tithes and offerings and first fruits. Because again, that's a question that's come up for several people. But for now, allow me to just pray for us as we worship God with our tithes and offerings and we prepare to hear His word. Father, we thank you for the month of December. We thank you for the exciting news that the year is coming to an end and that you've seen us through another year. And Lord, it's been a hard year for some of us. It's been a good year for others. But Lord, in every essence, we are here and we give you thanks for the year that has been. And Lord, as we prepare our hearts to give, I pray that Lord, you would just build us uh, in us a sense of gratitude, a sense of joy at the fact that we have a God who is our provider. Lord, as we come towards the end of the year, I pray that this year would end well for every single one of us in every way. And Lord, as we give to you uh, in thanksgiving, as we prepare our heart for the next year, Lord, I pray that you'd give us a sense of hope for 2022. I pray that you'd give us a sense that this will be a great year for us because you've already spoken into this year. And Lord, I speak a blessing over your people. Lord, as we prepare now to hear your word, as we prepare to hear this word that reminds us who we are as a people, reminds us about Christmas and what it means to us. I pray that Lord Jesus, you would give us a sense of joy, expectation that God is with us. And so I speak a blessing over you, God's people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together. Amen. Hello, Mavuno family. I'm so glad that you're able to join us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever it is that you're watching this. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to Mavuno Church. Uh, my name is James Mushai. I'm one of the pastors at Mavuno. I have the privilege of leading and serving... <laughs> I have the privilege of leading and serving in a campus called Mavuno Church Hill City. Uh, this month, uh, we'll be going through a sermon series as we go through the Christmas season, uh, our new sermon series that we're calling Hope Merchant. And I'm really excited about what God will be saying to us and what we'll be learning uh, from His Word as we go through this series. I want to start us off with a question. And here it is. Um, what, do you, what does it take for a miracle to happen? What is the one thing without which there cannot be a miracle? That's a question I want you to think about right now. What do you think it is? What's the one ingredient without which a miracle cannot happen? I want you to think about that a little bit, and I'll get back to it, uh, you know, later on in the message. But I want you to put that at the, at the back of your mind. Um, what lessons could the Bible possibly have for us in this Christmas season? Could there be something that God is saying to us? Are there lessons hidden for us in the Word of God uh, that we could learn? That's the question we'll be asking, and we'll be trying to draw out uh, some of those lessons as we get into this Christmas season. As I thought about it, I realized that we probably have two groups of people, two categories of people, as we are approaching Christmas 2021. The first group is those of us who are really, really excited about Christmas. It could be that as you watch this, you're super excited about Christmas. I'm excited uh, about Christmas. For you, it's your favorite time of the year. 
And there's lots to be excited about because Christmas brings with it many blessings. You know, it comes with an extended break uh, from work for most people and most industries. For those of us who don't get an extended break, it usually comes with a slowing down uh, so that life is not as busy, it's not as hectic as it normally is. For many people, it comes with opportunities to reconnect with family. It means that it's possible for people from out of town, family members and loved ones, uh, to travel and to come uh, for you to be able to connect with them. Even if you've been in the same town, you're not from out of town, uh, for those of us who are in the same city, life slows down enough that we are able to connect together at this time. With kids home from school, with work slowing down, Christmas and December generally brings with it opportunities for extended connection with family. Our kids love the Christmas season. They love it because it's an opportunity to bring, uh, to receive gifts and Christmas presents. They love it because they get opportunity to travel to different places, whether it's up country to visit relatives or to different holiday destinations. There are many things that Christmas brings with it uh, that, that, that just cause us to be excited about it. So that's the first category of people. You're looking forward to it and you're super excited about the Christmas season. But it could be that as you watch this, you're in completely the opposite direction. You're in, you're in an, an, a category opposite to the one that I'm describing. You aren't looking forward to Christmas at all. You're not excited. You're not happy. You don't see how Christmas will bring you joy this year. In fact, it could even be that the thought of Christmas is causing you great anxiety. It's making you anxious. You're worried and you're concerned about what this will mean. It's causing you great pain. It's bringing deep sorrow into your heart for some reason or the other. Whatever category you fall into, whether you're super excited about Christmas or you're dreading the thought of Christmas 2021, I want you to know that I'm glad that you're watching. I believe that God has you here for a reason. I believe that in this season of serious joy or extreme sorrow, uh, uh, there are lessons that God has in store for you and that he wants you to learn uh, while you're here as we go through this sermon series. So I'm truly excited that you're able to join us. We are excited uh, as the Mavuno family that you're able to connect with us uh, through this sermon. And so welcome to our service as we get into uh, the Christmas season. We're going to look at, at the Christmas story a little differently uh, this month. What lessons could we learn from the story of Christmas that will speak to us? What could the word of God have in store for us? We're going to be looking and asking that question uh, by looking through the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, uh, and the things that he had to say concerning the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, there are four Gospels in the Bible, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the books that describe the life of Jesus uh, when he was here on earth. Bible scholars have sometimes called Isaiah the fifth gospel. It's an Old Testament book, but the reason it's given that title is that it speaks so much. No other book apart from the four gospels talks so much about the Messiah, about this, uh, this child, uh, this king who God had promised who would be born. And so this month we'll be looking at the promises in the book of Isaiah and we'll be saying, what are the, what are the promises saying? What did they mean for the people who are hearing them? And perhaps more importantly, what do they mean for you and for me today? So the question we'll be asking ourselves is, how do we respond to the things that God's word said, the words of Isaiah, and what they mean for us today, even as we go through them? That's the context of our series this month. We're calling our sermon series Hope Merchant, and we'll be talking a little about that as we go through the different sermons. And I want us to dive right in by reading the first prophecy concerning the birth of Jesus that is recorded in the book of Isaiah. This prophecy is recorded in Isaiah chapter 7. We're going to read from verse 13 to verse 16. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13 to verse 16. And here's what it says. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Then Isaiah said, Listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of God as well? All right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. By the time this child is old enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong, he will be eating yogurt and honey. For before the child is that old, the lands of the two kings you fear so much will both be deserted. I want to start by, uh, you know, painting a picture of the context in which these words were being spoken. 
The prophet Isaiah was delivering a message. He's delivering it to the king of Judah and to his people. The king at that time was a king called Ahaz. And I want to paint a picture of the context so that we have a little bit of an understanding of, of the, the space into which these words were being spoken. So here's the context. The first thing you want to understand is this, that Judah was under attack. At this specific time when this word was being spoken, Judah was under attack from not one kingdom, but two kingdoms. The kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Syria had both risen up and had come to bring war against the kingdom of Judah. In other words, it was a time of distress for the kingdom of Judah because they were being attacked by two kings. That's the first thing that you need to understand about the context for this prophecy. The second thing is this, uh, that the prophecy itself was, that tr- uh, was God saying to the children of uh, Judah, to King Ahaz and his people, trust in God, he will deliver you. In fact, he went a little further than that if you caught it in the words of Isaiah. He says, trust in God, he will deliver you and ask him for a sign. All right. So the first thing about the context is that the words are being spoken to Judah and a kingdom under attack. But the second thing is that God is saying, I myself will deliver you. That's the prophecy that, that, that is sort of coming to them at their time of distress. The third thing I want to share with you about the context is I'm going to take a little bit of a detour and I want to teach you a little bit about Bible prophecy uh, and and something that we find when we read through the Bible and as we read through many of the prophecies that we come across. Many times or sometimes the prophecies have two levels of fulfillment. The prophecies were, uh, 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 you know, the prophet would have been speaking something that will happen in the future before it happened. But some of those things would be fulfilled at two levels, what Bible scholars call the near fulfillment and the far fulfillment. The near fulfillment would be something that happens in the short term, and the far fulfillment would be something that happened at a much later time. I'm going to read the prophecy again, just so that I can draw out this lesson. All right, then the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel which means God is with us. Verse 15 of Isaiah 7 continues, By the time this child is old enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong, he will be eating yogurt and honey. For before the child is that old, the lands of the two kings you fear so much will both be deserted. The near fulfillment of this prophecy would have been simple. In the lifetime of King Ahaz, a child was born and his parents named him Emmanuel. And before this child was very old, the two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Syria were both going to be destroyed. They were going to be laid waste. They would be desolate and deserted. That was the near fulfillment of this prophecy. God desired to make that promise clear and to give that sign so that when the two nations were destroyed, it would be clear that he had kept his word that the thing he had spoken, the promises he had given to King Ahaz, it would be clear that he actually fulfilled those promises. So that's the near fulfillment of the promise. A child was born in the lifetime of King Ahaz uh, and the two nations uh, of Israel and Syria were both destroyed. For the far fulfillment, I'm going to read a second scripture. And that's in Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Here's what Matthew says. In chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, all this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew would have been taking his readers back to what we call the Old Testament, Matthew is a first century follower of Jesus. He's speaking mostly to the Jews, the people who are living in Judea. And he's trying to draw them back to their history. He's trying to draw them back to the lessons and the prophecies that had been spoken, the scriptures that they believed in. And he's giving them a simple message. There was a prophecy that was spoken over Israel and over our people. The prophecy uh, that a child would be born. And then he's saying to them that this Jesus of Nazareth, is the fulfillment of that prophecy. In other words, the birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary was the fulfillment of the words of Isaiah. That's the far fulfillment. The words of Isaiah were being spoken about 740 years before the birth of Jesus. And so the near fulfillment happened, uh, you know, within a short time of when the prophecy was spoken. The far fulfillment happened centuries later through the birth 
of Jesus. So that's a little context for our reading uh, for today. That these words were recorded at a time when Judah was in serious trouble. That the words were a prophecy. They were a promise from God that he would take care of his people. That this prophecy had two levels. It had a near fulfillment in the lifetime of King Ahaz and it had a far fulfillment in the birth of Jesus. I started us off with a question and I'm going to take you back there. What does it take for a miracle to happen? What is the one ingredient without which there cannot be a miracle? You know, people answer this question differently. Some people will say the power of God, but I would argue that the power of God is always present. It's always there. So that's not entirely accurate. There's no time when the power of God is not present or is limited. Some people say that what it takes, the thing without which there cannot be a miracle is faith. But my reading of the Bible tells me that's not entirely accurate either because I see many people who needed a miracle but they did not have the faith themselves. But the miracle came anyway on account of someone believing on their behalf. And so I see that faith isn't necessarily the answer. So what is the ingredient? What's the one thing without which there cannot be a miracle? As I thought about it, I realized that the absolute necessity for a miracle is an impossible situation. The one thing without which there cannot be a miracle is an impossibility. The one thing that has to be there in order for a miracle to be performed is an impossible situation. Now, here's why I'm talking about miracles. Because I want us to focus on the promise that God gave. A virgin shall be with child. Why? Why a virgin? Why not a young woman? Why not an older woman? Why did it have to be a virgin? You see, for us, even for those of us who have received the blessing of of, of Jesus and his birth on earth, uh, you know, we've never received a savior before. We we didn't have, uh, you know, we wouldn't have had an expectation of a virgin birth. We wouldn't have known better if Jesus was born of a, you know, in a regular way uh, to a regular family without any, you know, uh, supernatural things happening. We would have been none the wiser. If God had said that at some point a child shall be born, all we would have been waiting for was a child. So why did God bother to set up the virgin birth? I put it to you that God was setting up a miracle. I put it to you that God was saying, uh, uh, you know, that, that because never before, and by the way, never since has this happened, he was setting a bar that he alone could meet. He was promising a thing that no one could accomplish apart from him. God was setting himself up. He was raising the bar. He was saying, I will do an impossible thing. And when I do that impossible thing, it will be a sign to you that I fight for those who are my people. Verse 14, we read, it said, All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. I want us to look at the meaning and significance of this promise. And I want us to look at what it meant for three groups of people. The first group would be the nation of Judah, the initial hearers of this prophecy. What would this promise have meant to them? What God was saying to them was that he would personally take care of them. What he was saying is that I am invested personally in your protection and in your well-being. He was saying that I myself will rise up and go to war on your behalf against the kingdom of Syria and against the kingdom of Israel. In other words, the meaning of this promise, of this promise and this prophecy was that, it didn't, was that it didn't matter how big the army of Israel was. He was saying to Judah that, you know, how big and advanced the Syrian military machine was, was completely irrelevant because it wasn't going to be about them fighting Judah. How small and ineffective, uh, you know, the military operation of Judah was did not count at all. God was saying all those things are irrelevant because I will fight for you. That's the promise that he was speaking to the nation of Judah. The question though was this, how would they respond to his promise? The first group of people is the original hearers, which was the kingdom of Judah under King Ahaz. The second group of people is the first century Jews, the people whom whom Matthew draws their attention to this promise. 
As Matthew was writing to them, he's telling them, hey, I hope you haven't forgotten something that was said in our scriptures. I hope you haven't, it hasn't been so long that you no longer remember the words of Isaiah. He's saying to them, a promise was made to us and this promise was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. What would this have meant to them? You see, the Jews were suffering the shame of having foreigners rule over them. The shame of being oppressed by unfair taxes to set up, to maintain, a, a, you know, a, 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 an empire that had nothing to do with them, the Roman Empire. Then along comes Matthew and he says, hey, a virgin shall be with child. A virgin shall be with child. Remember those words? That's what he says to them. He was reminding them that this thing has happened. God kept his promise. By the way, on a little side note, the word that means virgin in the book of Isaiah could have meant two things. It could have meant virgin, but it could also have meant a maiden, meaning a young lady. But the word that Matthew uses in his gospel doesn't have a double meaning. It can only be interpreted in English as the word virgin. And so it's almost as though Matthew is establishing the bar. At it's not going to be a regular birth. It is going to be a miraculous birth. It's going to be a virgin birth. And so he sets up the bar again. He sets up this impossible situation so that he can say to his audience, God has done it. He has performed this miracle. In other words, Matthew was saying to his people, it matters not that you're an occupied territory. It matters not that you're under serious Roman oppression. It matters not that you have no authority over yourselves. The only thing that matters is that almighty God kept the promise that he made to the people of Israel. But here's the question, guys. There was a question. How would they respond to his promise? The third group of people is you and me. What does this promise mean for us today? For the kingdom of Judah and King Ahaz, the promise meant two things. I am the God of the impossible and I am fighting for you. For the first century Jews, the promise meant two things. I am the God of the impossible and I keep my promises. I have fulfilled what I said I would do. You know, it could be that you're watching this and you're looking at me and you're saying, I hear you, pastor, that's good. But what does this mean for me? Why are we even talking about a promise that is nearly 3,000 years old? What does this matter to me today? I put it to you that what God was saying through his promise to the kingdom of Judah and, his, and King Ahaz are the same things he's saying to us today. I put it to you that the same things he was saying to the first century Jews are the same things he's saying to us today. He's saying to you, I am the God of the impossible. I who performed that miracle, I am still that God. He's saying to you that I will take care of you and I will fight your battles. He's saying to you, I will keep every promise that I have given to you. But the question, guys, is how will you respond? I don't know what impossibility you're facing today or this Christmas season, but this is God's word for you. He's saying to you that you need not despair. He's saying to you that you can trust in him because he is the God of the impossible and because he's fighting for you. What could God be saying to us through this message? as he reminds us that he's our good father, as he reminds us that he's the God of the impossible, as he reminds us that he keeps every promise he's, uh, he makes, what could he possibly be saying? What could he possibly be inviting us to today? I want to share with you some things, two things that I believe that God is asking you to do as I bring this message to a close. I believe that God is calling us in this Christmas season to do two things, and I want to put this invitation to you. The first thing is this, renew your hope. God is inviting you to renew your hope. I said that our sermon series is called Hope Merchant. You see, God is the ultimate hope merchant. It's why you're watching this. Whether you're watching this in your living room, whether you've caught it by chance on YouTube, uh, you know, you're in your car going somewhere, or you're at work or in your di a different place, God has made you catch this because he wants to bring hope into your life. He wants to give a promise over you and to, assure, uh, to affirm you and assure you that he's still with you. God is inviting you to renew your hope. And I'm going to give us two ways that I want us to do this. The first thing is, is to pray. The first way that you renew your hope is by prayer. Some of us have already stopped praying. There are things that you are trusting God for, but it's been so long you've given up on the promise. It's been so long you've concluded, surely it cannot still be coming. 
And God's word to you today is that I am the God of the impossible. It doesn't matter how things look. I am with you and I will fight for you. And my invitation to you is that you will come back to that place of prayer, that you will come back to that place of waiting upon the Lord and inviting Him to intervene in your situation. God is asking you to renew your hope. He's asking you to do that first by praying. But secondly, He's asking you to do that by being thankful. It could be that this has been a horrible, horrible year for you, but you still have something that you can be thankful for. And God is inviting you into a space of thankfulness. And I'm inviting you as you watch this, would you think, uh, would you process, would you seek yourself and say, what are some things that I'm thankful to God for? In fact, I want to challenge you. Uh, would you take a selfie video? Uh, if you worship in one of our Mavuno campuses, would you just take a, test, uh, a selfie video and testify? Give a testimony of how God has watched over you, how God has blessed you, even in this difficult time. And I'm going to ask you to, to share that, uh, you know, with your campus pastor or with someone that you serve under in the Mavuno campus where you worship. If you're part of our online community, uh, you know, send it to our WhatsApp number uh, that will be put up on the screen. I want you to renew your hope by being thankful and by speaking out and sharing the testimony of the things that God has done for you, even in this difficult time. God is inviting us to do two things. The first thing is to renew your hope. You renew your hope by coming back to a space of prayer if you had given up. The second thing is by being thankful and expressing your gratitude. To God. Secondly, God is inviting you to be a hope merchant. As God invites us to a place of hoping and trusting in Him, He's also inviting us to a place of spreading hope. He invites you to partner with Him. He invites you to be a merchant of hope, to be someone who spreads hope to other people this Christmas season. And there are three ways that I want you to do this. Uh, this is our assignment at the end of this message. I want you, number one, to pray. I want you to pray for someone that you know desperately needs hope. I want you to pray for a friend, for a family member who you know has given up. You know that this year has been impossibly difficult for them and you know they desperately need hope, need hope. And I want you to take a position of prayer on their behalf. I want you to pray that God will shine His light in their dark situation. I want you to pray that God will renew their hope and will help them renew their hope. The first thing I want you to do is to pray. The second thing is I want you to be practical. I want you to do something practical. I want you to give that person a call. I want you to send that person a message and let them know you're praying for them. I want you to let them know that as you're trusting God for the impossible situations in your own life, you're also trusting God for the impossible situations in their life. I want you to let them know that you're trusting God on their behalf, even in their place of pain, even where maybe they themselves have given up. I want you to let them know that you haven't given up and that you're standing with them. And finally, I want you to be a hope merchant by sharing this message. I want you to invite someone to church with you this Christmas season as you go to church. I want you to bring them to this place of hope, this place of light, where sometimes there's a lot of darkness in our lives. I want you to bring someone along. If the person is too far, if you can't reach them physically, if you're not able to physically bring them along to church with you, I want you to share this message with them. This message is gonna be on our YouTube page. Send them a link, tell them, hey, I believe this will be a blessing to you. I want you to watch this sermon. I believe that there's a word for you here. These are the two things that I believe God is inviting us to do this Christmas season. God is inviting you to renew your hope. He's inviting you to a place of saying, hey, you know what? I believe you still love me. I believe you can still fight my battles. I believe that you will give me victory. God invites you to renew your hope. But secondly, God invites you to be a hope merchant. He invites you to bring hope into the life of someone else. He invites you to help someone in their dark moment to see some light, to experience His goodness and to experience His love. My prayer is that in this Christmas season, God will give every single one of us the grace to be hope merchants to the glory and to the honor of His name. God bless you, Mavuno. Have a wonderful week ahead. <laughs>